he took eight different pupa and sewed them all together. They are all brainless. Brains taken out. Dissected. Hello, my intellectually curious love bugs, and happy Halloween! Halloween is my favorite holiday, so I thought it would be really fun to dress up and also talk about some crazy Halloween Frankenstein-like experiments that were done on insects to understand how insect development works. So if that sounds interesting to you, you better keep watching because it gets crazy. We take brains from some insects and smash them into bodies of others and sew insects together and tie them off. It's crazy. If you are new here, hi, my name is Nancy. I'm an entomologist, which means that I study bugs and I live in Ecuador where normally I'm doing ecotourism. However, that isn't happening right now. So welcome to my YouTube channel. If you like learning about bugs every week, you should like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and make sure that bell icon is ding so that way if I dress up or do something crazy, then you see it right away. Today's entomology word of the day is juvenile hormone, and if you want to know what that is and how it works, then you're going to have to keep watching to the end of this video. Without further ado, let's get into it. Before we get too far along, we need to set the stage. So we are looking at holometabolous insects and holometabolous insects are like butterflies and like beetles that have complete metamorphosis, which means they have four life stages. They have the egg, they have the larva, they have the pupa or the cocoon or the chrysalis, and then the adult. This is very unique and different than a lot of other insects that have what we call incomplete metamorphosis. And you can see all those types in this video up here but we're not talking about that today. Holometabolous insects have a lot going on with their development because not only are you going from one life stage to the other in four complete different life stages, but even as the caterpillar or the larva or the grub, we will see that the larva will start off really small and then get bigger and bigger and bigger through successive molts. The question is, what differentiates those successive molts to get bigger and bigger and bigger versus the chemical signals that tell the insect to go from one life stage to the other. In the 50s, when these set of experiments by Williams was conducted, we had a very rudimentary understanding of insect development. We knew that it happened, we knew that it was probably the brain responsible, and also a little piece of the insect called the prothoracic gland located in the thorax, which we're so good at naming things. We didn't know how they worked together, if they worked together, what exactly they were responsible for. So these experiments by Williams was really trying to figure out what pieces and parts of development were triggered by what parts of the body, the brain, the prothoracic gland, both, neither, what time, when. So he set out and designed four different experiments to basically ask the question, what are the roles of the brain and of the prothoracic gland in the development of holometabolous insects. And he chose the Cecropia moth as his insect of choice, mainly because they're really big, easy to see what's going on, easy to tie together, easy to dissect pieces out of. So it's a really big caterpillar, very easy to like just pull pieces out of and smash them back together. To do this, his First experiment, and all of these are linked in the reference section below for your reading pleasure. But for his first experiment, he took a big fat fifth instar Cecropia caterpillar and tied it off behind the head and right behind the thorax. This kept the blood or the hemolymph that was floating around the brain, around the brain, or the hemolymph floating around the prothoracic gland and the thorax in the thorax, and the blood that was in the abdomen in the abdomen. This way he could see exactly what parts and at what times was responsible for the molting. He ran three little mini experiments under this big experiment. Before the last instar of the larva is about to molt, they change color, they change shape, and they also have a behavioral change. So before any of that happened, the first experiment that Williams did is he just took a fifth instar, pretty fat, about to pupate sometime, and tied it off behind the head and the thorax and waited and saw that nothing happened. So William's second experiment is that he took another 
fifth instar larva or caterpillar and waited until it was starting to spin silk. He waited for two days for it to spin silk, which indicated that it was ready to transform from the larval stage to the pupal stage. Two days after spinning silk, he tied it again at the back of the head and the back of the thorax. And in this case, just the thorax pupated. So yeah, like min minus one head, plus one thorax pupation thing, and minus one abdomen. <laughs> In his third mini experiment, he waited until the larva was done spinning silk and went into a pre-pupal form, then tied it off behind the head and behind the thorax, and saw that the whole thing pupated into its little pupa cocoon. These series of experiments taught Williams that both the brain and the prothoracic gland were responsible for the molting, which is something we had assumed before, but now there was definite proof that they are both responsible. Now we start getting to the Frankenstein territory. Brains, sewing of insects together, mashing bits, gluing them together. So let's get into this. In Williams' second experiment, he took eight different pupa that had their brains removed. Remember I was saying it was big, good to have big caterpillars, though it's easy to like take out brains and then also do transplants of brains because that's what we're getting into. So he took eight different pupa and sewed them all together. They are all brainless, brains taken out, dissected. Then he took the brain of a different pupa, which was in diapause, which means it wasn't going to emerge for several weeks. So he took that other brain, right? Then inserted it into his ring of pupa. All of these pupa, because they were sewn together, were sharing the same blood system. Each one of these pupa all had a prothoracic gland. They just didn't have a brain. So he took a brain of a different pupa and smushed it into the front one of this ring. And all eight of these brainless pupa that were only being stimulated by one implanted brain all transformed into adults. And this experiment suggested that one brain is a sufficient enough amount to stimulate all the prothoracic glands in these different pupa, which then made them molt into the adult form. For his third experiment, so he basically did the same thing. He took a ring of six pupa, again, they were all smashed together, so they were all sharing blood, and removed all of their brains, and then took the brain of a different pupa and inserted it into the first pupa of the ring, so one out of six. He waited until the first two started to show signs of transformation into the adult and removed the first pupa and removed the last pupa off of this ring. And he found that pupas one through five molted into the adult and the sixth pupa did not, which suggests that there's a hormonal threshold to trigger the molting process. For his fourth experiment, he was like, okay, well, it's really hard to take out the prothoracic gland of these pupa, but I wanna see exactly what is going on with that prothoracic gland. So for his fourth experiment, he took a pupa that had its brain and prothoracic glands and then glued it with wax to four abdomens of other pupa. So these four abdomens didn't have a brain and didn't have a prothoracic gland and were glued together so they would all be sharing hemolymph again. So to recap, last experiments, all prothoracic glands, one brain. These experiments, just one brain, one prothoracic gland for the four glued together pupa. He found that just the first two pupa emerged as adults and the very last one didn't have any transformation whatsoever. This is suggesting that the brain is triggering the prothoracic gland and if you didn't have prothoracic glands, then you wouldn't be able to do the molting. All in all, these experiments showed that both the brain and the prothoracic gland are important. It showed that the brain stimulates the prothoracic gland, and it shows that the hormones are being released into the blood or the hemolymph of the insects to stimulate the prothoracic gland. We know a lot more now for, since William's initial work about how insects molt and develop, but his work really was the ground basis, even though it was a little bit gruesome. 
Please let me know which one of these experiments is your favorite, like down below, or which one of these experiments shocked you the most. Because oh, the first time I heard about these, I was like, oh my god, this is the craziest thing. How is that even possible? How could we even do that? Who thought of this? So I'd be really interested and curious to know which one is your favorite or which one was most shocking to you. His work really laid the foundations for many other scientists to come along and really hammer this whole thing into place. So now we know a lot more. This brain hormone that was stimulating the prothoracic gland is released by the brain and is called the PTTH or prothoracic tropic hormone. The prothoracic tropic hormone tells the prothoracic gland to start producing ecdysone. And ecdysone, along with a molting fluid that has digestive enzymes, is secreted through the bottom layers of the exoskeleton to separate the old exoskeleton off of the insect, and start digesting it away, which allows the insect to molt. That is the basic mechanics of how insects molt. Later, it was discovered that a hormone called juvenile hormone is keeping insects in their larval stage. This juvenile hormone is telling the insect to stay in its juvenile or instar state. When you have juvenile hormone present in the blood or in the hemolymph, everything else still functions the same. You have the brain telling the prothoracic gland to release a dyson, which is then released to cause the exoskeleton break, to break open and the insect just molts into the next instar because this juvenile hormone is present. When juvenile hormone is at really, really low levels or not present at all, but you are still receiving the signals from the brain to the prothoracic gland to release a dyson. This is when we see molting from one life stage to another, which is what Williams was seeing. Understanding juvenile hormone really helped us as well in development of our agriculture. Many insecticides include juvenile hormone or at least a synthetic of it. So when it is applied to crops, it keeps insects in their juvenile and larval state. So that way they cannot go on to reproduce and lay more eggs. I hope that you love bugs enjoyed coming back in time with me and seeing some of the crazy experiments that we used to do on insects, but also show you how valuable some of these experiments were to help us get to the knowledge that we have today. Well, love bugs, I hope that you enjoyed not only the festivities and the costuming, but also today's topic about these different experiments. If you are interested in seeing another video where I dissect an experiment, take a look up here. It's the mystery of the pink Katie did up here. Duh. And if you just want more kind of commentary, react videos, then you can find these down here. I will see you love bugs next week. Bye.